Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, today's, today's topic is sort of one of the big questions. It's one of those, have you ever wondered type of questions. And we're going to address quite possibly my favorite topic in biology, which is the evolution of life. And in particular, we're going to focus on the theory of natural selection. And I'll outline what's significant about the theory of natural selection as well as the basic concepts associated with the theory. But I thought I'd start off with kind of a have you ever wondered uh, set of questions. Like, have you ever wondered why some animals seem to blend in with their environment so well? Uh, you've got a great gray owl here who looks like the bark and the lichen of the forest in which it lives, and uh, a pair of red-eyed green frogs from Costa Rica who seem to match the green habitat in which they live. In fact, uh, they will, during the day, draw their bodies in and essentially hide on the underside of leaves and be virtually invisible. Um, similarly, uh, you ever wonder why chimpanzees seem to have facial characteristics that look very much like our own and uh, exhibit emotions very much like we do and happens to be so very intelligent. Do you ever wonder why all animals in uh, a common group kind of have common features? You know, all of these are owls, a snowy owl on the left, a burrowing owl in the middle, a hawk owl on the right, and again, another great gray owl on the bottom. All of these owls have owl-like characteristics, which imply some kind of relatedness. They look distinctly different from, let's say, toucans and parrots. And so when we look at animals, you ever wonder why all cats have cat-like features and dogs have dog-like features and ferns have fern-like features? Ever wonder why some birds are so very colorful, like the scarlet macaw or here the chestnut mandibled toucan? What's the deal with their beak anyway? Why do toucans have such big beaks? Why, why does that exist, whereas a parrot has kind of this hooked beak. Finally, ever look at organisms that you know are related, but yet they're so very different? For instance, why are some frogs really crazy colored, bright red with blue legs or green with black spots? And why are some drab, like the one in the middle, the gray tree frog? Ever wonder why some frogs are super poisonous? In fact, some of them are among the most poisonous animals on the planet. And strangely, it's these super poisonous ones that are really colored. Well, our best explanation for this is based on a theory. And I want to remind you that a theory represents the highest level of understanding Theories are big explanations Theories include laws and hypotheses Theories are the big ideas in science In biology, we refer to the theory of evolution by natural selection. Now, interestingly, when we talk about the word evolution, the idea of evolution is actually fact. So it has transcended theory, and the reason why it's fact is we can actually see examples of evolution on the planet. And so we know that life definitely evolves. And that evolution literally means change in time. So the mere fact that dinosaurs have gone extinct means that they were once here 
and now they are gone, and that in itself is evolution. Life has changed in time. Any time something goes extinct and disappears from the planet, it is showing us that life has evolved. Furthermore, we know that things like bacteria evolve pretty rapidly in response to antibiotics, as do plants in response to pesticides or herbicides, and insects in response to pesticides. We can see life evolving over the course of short periods of time if you're a bacteria, which have short generation times, or if you're as complex as birds, so long as we have enough years of data sets. What is the theory in our discussion here is how life evolves. The theory is the explanation for how life evolves. And the theory that we're going to talk about today is natural selection. which explains how life evolves it explains life's biodiversity it explains why genetics DNA and biochemical processes occur the way they do on our planet. We actually say in biology that natural selection is the unifying theory for all of biology and that biology makes little sense in the absence of natural selection. I'll say that again. Biology makes little sense in the absence of natural selection. Now today we are not going to go into how new species evolve we're not going to look at why some animals are colorful and others are not by looking at specific mechanisms that cause those colors. But what we are going to look at is the general overarching ideas that explains how those differences between living organisms come to be. And so I want to uh, start off by having us consider not these owls again, but the first major idea that helps us understand the theory of natural selection. So our first statement, or the first key thing to point to, is that nature, that variations exist in nature. But here, when I say variations exist in nature, I am referring to within a population of a single species. So I put up these three pictures to bring up a point. Um, the two cubs on the left are black bears, yet one is brown. And if you did not know this, there's also a black bear called the Komodo bear which is all white, so the same color as a polar bear, but yet a white black bear is a black bear, and a brown black bear is a black bear, and a black black bear is a black bear. All are black bears, but they vary in their colors. The center picture are Icelandic horses. Icelandic horses look very different from Przewalski's horses. They look very different from Arabian horses, they look very different from Mustangs, but they are all horses of the same species, 
with different variations. The final picture is of a fawn. This is a white-tailed deer fawn. However, it has what's referred to as a piebald morphology with that white head and actually has white boots. That's its mother in the background, a typical looking doe. Variations exist in nature. Variations exist within a population of a species. Now, some variations are acquired. Acquired variations are things that you get in living your life. If you sit out in the sun and you get tan after, let's say, three days of sitting out in the sun, you have acquired a new skin complexion from the sun. The environment has changed your variation. Now, your capacity to tan is something that is inherited, but the color of your skin at that moment is an environmental variation. If you get a haircut and shave your head, you have now a variation that's different from what you were, but this was acquired from your life and doing things in the moment. On the other hand, some variations are heritable. And what that means is that they are coded by your DNA or molecules on your DNA, and they cause traits that can be passed on. So a zebra with stripes produces babies with variations that they inherited from their parents, and great horned owls produce variations that give their chicks characteristics that make them look like their parents and eventually have their parents' traits. Some traits are heritable, and natural selection acts on heritable traits. Now, some of these heritable traits are things that we describe as beneficial variations. And if a variation is beneficial, we call it an adaptation. And here I've included three pictures relating to a beaver. A beaver is a rodent related to a woodchuck, but has a set of adaptations that has made it adapted to an aquatic life. That includes webbed feet, as well as a large leathery tail that can be used to steer underwater, or can be used to communicate with other beavers that are underwater. And some of their variations are variations that influence behavior. And those behaviors in this case might actually influence a beaver to make something like a lodge or create a dam in order to enhance its survival. So some adaptations can be physical features and some adaptations can be behaviors. These beneficial adaptations can be translated into the next generation only if they are in the genes. So adaptive traits are genetic traits that can be passed from one generation to another. Adaptations lead to things like beak shapes that fit perfectly in flowers that are then used to access food. Adaptations include behaviors like in the case of this puffin, which flies underwater to catch fish, or the long neck of a giraffe that allows it to access food that is very high. Not only does the giraffe have a long neck, but it has a purple tongue that it can actually stick out and grab super tiny leaves with. These are adaptations that enhance the survival 
of the animal. And that is the key thing. If a trait is adaptive, one of the key things that adaptive traits do is they increase survival. They make you better at getting food. They might make you better at blending in. Or they may just help you fit your environment in a way that increases your chance of getting access to food and mates. Now, one of the driving forces for these adaptations and for refining these adaptations is competition. And individuals that are better competitors often eat more, find shelter, and survive. But most importantly in the evolutionary story is that these adaptations increase reproductive output. Competition for limited resources like food, water, space, shelter, mates. These things drive the evolutionary process. Individuals that have traits that enhance their, their characteristics, that allow them to be better competitors, that allow them to find more mates, that allow them to have more babies, those adaptations will be retained and passed on to the next generation. Adaptations that ultimately increase reproductive output are the ones that will be retained and passed from one generation to the next. In biology, I say that life is all about the baby. If you think of life as a game, anything that enhances your survival so that you can live a little bit longer and allow you to produce a few more offspring, those traits will be retained and those traits will be selected for by natural selection. So to summarize, we know that there are variations within every population of a species. Some variations are beneficial. We call those beneficial variations adaptations. If you are well adapted to your environment, you become a better competitor. You get more access to food. You get more access to shelter, and most importantly, you get more access to mates. And if you reproduce, you pass those adaptations on to the next generation and incrementally life changes. Well, that's it. That's my lecture on natural selection. And uh, Should I keep boiling these until...